was a fabulous effort by the finance minister and i think the good thing was first of all they maintained the fiscal deficit at 3.4% which is given a lot of relief to everybody because given the tight liquidity we are in any expansion of the fiscal deficit would have been concerning so i think concerns on fiscal deficit concerns and everything else have been handled well Hello and welcome to the CNBC TV 18 special as we decode the budget fine print. Uh, Finance Minister Piyush Goyal has presented the interim budget. wasn't quite interim because it made tall promises for the future, not just for the next five years, but for the next ten years as well. As he articulated what the government will do if it was voted back to power. But to discuss uh, the announcements <coughs> made and the schemes presented in the budget, joining us is uh, the team from Fiki, Sandeep Samani, the president of Fiki. Thanks very much Hi. for joining us. Oh, yeah. Yaki Modi, the past president. President of Fiki, Pranav Saitha, the head of the tax committee at Fiki, Subrakanta Panda of the Orissa chapter, and of course Sangeeta Reddy joins us from Hyderabad. The gentlemen and Sangeeta, thanks very much for joining us here. Sandeep Somani, let me start by asking you: batted pretty much in every direction. The question then is: in trying to please everyone, have they done enough for someone? I think this budget is a statement of intent. Mm. Frankly, it it shows directionality. and i think uh, he's tried to deal with the concerns where he felt it was most justified so i think he's uh, trying to do a little with the uh, agrarian distress by this direct uh, transfer scheme 6000 rupees per uh, you know poor and marginal farmer mm. he's tried to get relief to the salaried and the low income 5 uh, lakh rupee income people mm. so i think he's tried to do what will probably get him also some votes, votes. yes yeah has it changed the mood enough uh, there have been concerns as far as growth uh, with the slowdown as far as the economy is concerned the hope is that this will spur consumption that of course has continued to be the driver of the economy uh, if you look at capital expenditure that has been a disappointment growing at about 4 to 5% so to your mind uh, does this have enough to provide a fillip to the economy i think it has enough as far as government can do but government can do only that much hmm. you need fiscal policy you need monetary policy mm. so bulk of the thing will have to be done by the monetary policy <laughs> so the point is if the government thinking is the same huh. and this same government comes back we hope that the reserve bank of india will follow in the same line mm. you know more than us mm. that real interest rate in india are highest in the world mm. and no country in the world has progressed with less investment mm. as you mentioned mm. so investment cannot grow if your real interest rate is 10% hmm. so i so think so you are seeking a cut from the rbi the mpc will meet next week are you that's hopeful true. i am hopeful and that is the only way to create jobs otherwise we will keep crying on jobs but there's a 25 basis point or even if it's a 50 basis point it should cut should be 100 basis point that you can keep asking for it's not going to happen sir let's be very clear about that that's but true. what is a 25 basis point cut going to mean 25 basis point has no value so then it should be at least 50 basis point plus reduce in crr money is available in the market then only interest will go down but the rbi says liquidity is not a problem rbi says because they nobody issue is pinching to them who is pinching to us hmm. so we know liquidity is in crisis if you want to go to the bond market and raise money if rbi government of india has bond fetch 7 1/2% hmm. and they say no liquidity is crisis hmm. liquidity is tight Pranav Sai, I'll, I'll put that question to you. One, of course, is the assumption that uh, uh, that the MPC ought to now move as far as rates are concerned. But given the fact that we've seen a slippage on fiscal deficit, albeit it was expected, 3.4 percent uh, for FY19 and 3.4 percent for FY20, does this give the RBI space now to act on interest rates? You think? Yes. Yeah, so this is this is really a, a moot point. And and the way I would look at it is, yes, here is the RBI which is continuously projecting inflation at a certain rate. and every time it seems to go wrong on its projection and mm. the actual inflation rate that turns up is much less than mm. the expected rate as predicted by RBI itself here we are in the second half of this year growth has slipped from 7.4% in the first half to maybe an expected 6.8% it might be revised upwards later we don't of course we don't <laughs> we know don't but know. right, give right it, now give us what will happen with data so we have an inflation number of 2.19% yeah. in december yeah. we have growth slipping from 7.4 to 6.8% there is a slight slippage in the fiscal deficit there is no doubt about it is the need of the hour today giving a fillip to the growth and mm. job creation mm. 
definitely there are pros and cons to everything and certainly a drop in the interest rate will have its share of cons. Mm. Mm. But is, is it more the demand today, the need of the hour today to drop the interest rates? Yeah and give a fillip to growth chance to job creation mm. more than worrying about inflation given where 2.19 percent it is given where no, again I, my, I come back to my point on sure. is the case being overstated suddenly are we going to start to create jobs suddenly are we going to grow at That's eight at eight and a half percent even if we do see assuming we see a 50 basis point cut. I mean, I, I'm saying, you know, industry should be happy if it gets 25 basis points, given the past commentary that's coming from the RBI. But even if it were to be 50 basis points, are you really going to see such a sharp swing as far as growth is concerned? No, but, but when we see, when we look at our clients, what we see is liquidity tightening is a very real issue hmm. today, especially after ILFS, especially after the NBFs. So that's very real, let's hmm. face it. Hmm. And it's not that it's but going to have much, an immediate result. But how much of that is an issue that the RBI can deal with that, by way of an interest rate cut or even CRR, assuming that that demand were to come into, yeah. uh, come into effect? Yeah. Because, I mean, let's look at what's happening with the corporate sector, for instance. Sure. Uh, there, there is the asset liability mismatch. There are corporate governance issues that are showing up as far as NBFCs sure. are concerned, sure. one after the other. So, you know, I mean, w is, it, is it not then prudent for the RBI to wait and watch? It, it's like this, we have to make an effort. I'm not saying that a reduction of 25 basis points or 50 basis points is going to immediately yield results. There's a lag. We, know, we all know there's a lag of, of maybe a few months or even a year. But the point is that we have to take steps. Hmm. We have to make an effort in the right direction. Okay. And that's where I feel that a uh, reduction in the rate from the RBI would be a welcome step at this point of time. <clears throat> it will have its share of cons. Hmm. It has its share of risks. But on balance, that's the right thing, I would feel. Okay. Uh, at this stage of the economy. Be before I get the other panelists in, uh, very quickly on yes. what has been announced as far as the salary class is concerned. The sure. Economic Affairs Secretary clarifying <coughs> to me that these changes are applicable from the 1st of April. Uh, secondly, there is no change in the slab or the limit. Uh, it's That's only right. the rebate that has changed. Right. So how significant uh, is this really going to be? And B, even on the basis of standard deduction and all the other announcements that have come in, from a consumptive uh, capacity perspective, how much will do you think this will impact. So, so I would feel it impacts a large taxpayer base and the impact straight away is a 10,000 rupee tax saving per individual mm. which today a rate rebate was not available probably he says the rebate will be up to 12,500 yeah. till today it is 2,500. That's right. So clearly there's a 10,000 to 12,500 rebate that a person gets and that's that's not an insignificant number given that it impacts that particular category of population which really needs mm. that money in its hands and it can spur consumption mm. an extra 10000 rupees to a millionaire may not make a big difference to his consumption pattern yeah. but an extra 10000 in the pocket every year for a common man certainly makes a difference mm. also it sends the right signal the right message i think incremental changes in the slab rate of 25000 increase or 50000 increase we have seen a lot yeah. This is the first time there's a quantum jump and mm. a recognition that yes, given inflation, the threshold rate should be increased. Mm. So I think one must commend a step sure. to the extent it's welcome. Of course, more could have been done and so on. And but perhaps, I still think that under will, the circumstances, it's forward. not a no. it's not a very tiny, trivial increase. It's a fair decent point. increase. Fair point. Uh, Shubhakanta, let me ask you about the farm package that has been announced by the government and uh, perhaps some lessons being taken from the states that uh, that you look after, which is Orissa. Uh, some parts of Kalia, uh, the scheme that the Orissa government has announced, uh, part of this because uh, they're looking at uh, uh, providing about 6,000 rupees a year through the direct benefit transfer route into bank accounts in installments starting retrospectively from December, the first installment of about 2,000 rupees. <coughs> when that will happen, again, the Economic Affairs Secretary says it will happen soon, but they have to work with states to identify the beneficiaries. Uh, how meaningful is this likely to be? Well, uh, you know, as was uh, pointed out right at the beginning, I, I think, uh, you know, there is a recognition of the fact that there is an element of agrarian distress which mm. needs to be addressed. And, um, Finally, after, after denying it all, all, uh, all this while. Well, I mean, you know, whether you look at it from the point of view of denying it and finally accepting it or saying that, look, you know, a beginning has to be made at some point in mm. time and, and, you know, better now than, than never. And uh, so from that point of view, to say, to, to make this move and, and, you know, rather than link it to subsidies which may end up being wasteful or, or spur the wrong kind of, mm. 
uh, behavior, uh, uh, if I can put it that way. Uh, it's uh, you know a, play, a simple direct benefit transfer which yeah. which goes into the bank account of, of the identified farmer. Right. I think is a good way to get this going. Mm. And just like uh, you know the, the, the increase in the tax uh, exemption limits will will put hands uh, will put money in the hands of the of mm. the urban middle class. Mm. This is something which also uh, will put money in the hands of the of the rural sector. And mm. that you know whether it, it uh, uh, I mean addresses agrarian distress or ends up being discretionary spending. Yeah. Net net it is good for the economy. Well you know let's do the math uh, because uh, it works out to about 500 rupees a month. Now most people that we've spoken to once you know it's a it's a positive signal but does it really alleviate the pain? Does it actually change uh, the, the plight of the farmer today? Uh, it doesn't it's not even uh, the daily hiring for a tractor for instance is 500 rupees a day or something like that is is, is the math that I was given. So does it really meaningfully address the agrarian sector? Right. So why don't we then take a step back and look at the, at the, uh, you know, the macro issue, which is that this is something like 75,000 crores being pumped into the economy. Now we can, you know, obviously spend a lot of time discussing about whether it addresses the problem of uh, every individual farmer or any of them or, mm. or, you know, whichever permutation combination thereof. But in aggregate, the fact that you're looking at 75,000 crores being, you know, flowing into, into, uh, into farmers' hands and ultimately finding its way somewhere is the sort of, uh, you know, uh, is the sort of step which will, uh, you know, end up uh, pump priming uh, the economy. Yes, that is certainly the hope and I would imagine that uh, once there is a full budget, perhaps we will see states also putting forward matching grants and that may then uh, make things a lot better. But Sangeeta, let me come to you now. Uh, there was a lot of um, talk around Ayushman Bharat uh, uh, in the budget speech that Piyush Goel presented. Uh, you know, on balance, now we've got about a 100 day plus experience of the scheme so far. Uh, what would you expect from here on? So clearly, Shireen, uh, we can never undervalue the entire vision of the scheme, which is to bring 50 crore families under coverage. So I continue to commend the scheme. I believe that the first 100 days performance in terms of the number of people who have utilized hospitalization, mm who have come under the cover is also quite significant, which really shows the fact that this was a much needed scheme. Mm. I continue to iterate that you know many states have been doing this for the last five to eight years, yeah. and therefore there is a proof of concept in That's it. Right. What I was heartened by today's budget is that the dialogue slightly shifted now. Mm. It was beyond uh, talking about Ayushman Bharat to handle hospitalization, to also focus on health and wellness. Yeah. Now, we've been piloting a conversion of the primary health care uh, centers mm. into wellness centers. Mm. And that, if we do these two in combination with a good IT stack, I believe our health sector is on a positive road. You know, there are steps to be done yeah. in, still for the private sector, uh, you know, to spur increased private sector uh, development of infrastructure in right. tier three cities. Uh, there's, there's, there's lots more work to be done in terms of pricing, mm. in terms of the IT connectivity, in terms of using artificial intelligence, lots yeah. to be done, but I think these three are very strong beginnings. And uh, I think this one step which happened in terms of reduction of the, uh, the standard deduction on yeah. medical reimbursement, so it used to be 40K, it's gone to 50K. 50, yes. I commend the move, but I think, I think the, it was a too little. arithmetic now and I think that is what uh, some people are concerned about uh, and I'll start with you uh, Mr. Saita you know just as far as indirect taxes are concerned uh, GST shortfall uh, the indirect tax growth has been 6% versus 23% which was uh, budgeted uh, and you know the worry is that are we assuming uh, too much tax buoyancy to be able to deliver on the 3.4% number given the, the performance right so one has to go down the fine print and understand the detailing clearly, but, but somewhere the math seems to be a little uh, difficult to completely comprehend at first blush. But I, the way I would look at it is, yes, GST has fallen short in the current year probably. 
but the way I look at it is that it has kept growing mm. and it's stabilizing. Compliance is also improving. Mm. In this year, they dropped rates quite a bit on GST. Yeah. And I think the indirect tax collection number that you are looking at yeah. is probably not completely reflective of the growth. Mm. So the way I look at it is last year the GST collections on an average were 85,000 yeah. crore a month. And this year, this it's, about year it's about 90, about 95,000 to, yeah. 95, to a lack. Yeah. of crore one well, per well, month. Well, not accounting for refunds. We don't really have the refund numbers accurately. Yeah, but this is by and large. Yeah, but, yeah. but there's still a growth from 85 to 95 yeah. or whatever, or 12, 13 percent right. growth. I think the thing, probably the detail is in the excise, particularly mm. on petroleum products, mm. Mm. because crude prices have dropped, Drop, or cut yeah. in the rates because of, because of, you know, various reasons. And therefore, I think a large part of the drop mm in the expected collections on indirect tax may not entirely be because of GST or mm. GST may not even be the main reason right. but it might be more to do with excise and so on. Okay. So one has to get into the exact details but I think if that's the numbers at the moment I would go with uh, transparency and trust with the numbers yeah. but with a bit of caution to say we one has to go into the details. Uh, absolutely. Mr. Bodhi, let me ask you about you know the, the effort also to unlock a sector that has been stagnant for the last few years, real estate. It's had a series of problems now and with this announcement coming in on being able to uh, to offset your rental income for a second home and some of the other changes as well, do you believe that the housing sector perhaps could start to see a move up? I think it will take two more steps which were announced. One was announced that their intention to see that GST somehow comes down. Yeah, yeah. which Se will be a matter that will be taken correct. by the GST so council. Yeah. Secondly, again coming back, you will say I am talking of RBI every time. <laughs> Until unless interest rate come down and EMI <laughs> is reduced to house buyers, <laughs> whatever government may do, I am not going to buy or the poor man is not going to buy a house. <laughs> so what, because the housing sector is suffering from lack of demand. And demand will only come either price goes down mm. or EMI goes down. Mm. So government can do is price goes down mm. and bank has to do EMI come down. Huh. Combination of both, okay. then the we are through. Okay, so it comes back to Shakti Kanta Das and we'll have to see what he delivers uh, <laughs> uh, in, in the next few weeks. But uh, Sandeep, in terms of business confidence now, uh, you know, and the data is literally quite all over the place at this point in time it's hard to decipher what the data is telling us but uh, you know uh, industry captains like yourselves will have a better sense because your order books will tell you what's happening your sales will tell you what's really happening on the ground and we've seen patchy performance auto for instance has seen a difficult period cement sales on the other hand are showing double digit growth so what are you picking up from the ground in terms of confidence the ability to spend the ability to hire the ability to invest so I'm optimistic, personally. I think if you look at average capacity utilization across all industry, it's now bumped up to about 74, 75 percent. Mm. Mm. When you start getting to 80 percent, industry has to start planning expansion, right. where the green field, brown field, mm. brown field is shorter, green yeah. field takes a long time. I think there are some sector specific issues across some industries, but okay. that's unique to them. Mm. As you said, cement, the consumption is going up. But their cost has gone up, mm. so their PNL is under pressure. Mm. But overall, if you look at uh, industry, I think industry is on a good footing. Okay. Auto was poor in the third quarter mm. uh, of the year. Yeah. Uh, it had a poor Diwali, both uh, four wheelers as well as two wheelers. Two wheelers, yes. Uh, but I think uh, on the whole, industry will reinvest and start building capacity towards the end of this year. So, the, so it will still take all of uh, 2019 before we start to see fresh investment? So I think you will start seeing fresh investment post the new government. People will, people have started planning. Okay. But the actual work on the ground will start mm. towards the third quarter of the calendar year. Okay. All right. Uh, Shubhata, let me ask you in terms of all of the other announcements that we saw and more importantly uh, the vision that was sort of outlined which if they come back to power they will take forward but even if you look at any other political party I mean everyone is sort of saying the same things whether it's a minimum income guarantee or infrastructure spending and so on and so forth. On the back of that uh, you know this talk about digitalizing villages, uh, boosting infrastructure growth. What, what would you, what would be your key takeaways from what you have seen so far? Well, you know, first of all, I think it was a nice touch to sort of lay out the vision for the next 10 years. I mean, you can argue that this was a, a, a very public way of sort of uh, you know, giving a hint speech. at what, your, what yeah. your manifesto is going to be, but what's wrong in that? Yeah. And, uh, but from that point of view, I mean, I think the clarity of vision is w what is more important. I mean, you know, different people can have 
uh, different takeaways or focus on, on, on different aspects. But to my mind, the clarity of, of you know, where we are and you know, where we want to be in 10 years, mm. that was the more important part. Okay. Because too often we get caught up in the, in the short term uh, yeah. you know, uh, outlook or what did this, this budget uh, you know, bring about for industry or whatever it is. Yeah. So sort of you know, addressing the short term but laying out a vision for the long term I thought was a nice touch. Okay. Sangeeta, uh, the key takeaways outside of Ayushman Bharat and the health related announcements for you? So for me, the fact that everyone was touched upon, I think, was a good one. I especially appreciate the fact that the unorganized sector and the uh, entire social planning for them, mm. the social security cover, yeah. because I yeah. think that's a segment that's not been looked into enough. That was a good one. I want to reiterate that I believe that this becoming a five trillion economy, five years, this aspirational vision is powerful. And I also think the AI point was important to reiterate mm. because in an IT industry which has hitherto grown on a wage arbitrage, India yeah. does this lower cost, yeah. to come out front and say that we will do AI, we will do mm. products of the future, mm. that was an important point to come and I think mm. that would propel us into a different level on the IT front. Yes. So social sector, multi-sectorial approach mm. and the AI were the highlights for me. Uh, yes, you had the Kam Denu Yojana and the National Center for Excellence for AI all in the same uh, same budget speech. So, uh, as I pointed out, li quite literally something for everybody. Wrap up comments from each one of you. Sandeep Samani, I'll start by asking you. So, you think that uh, uh, that this has enough now uh, to be able to swing things in the government's favor uh, for the elections? Because let's be clear, th th this, this is being positioned as an election budget. Uh, that's a very difficult question. <laughs> Uh, I think uh, in terms of uh, swinging it in their favor, I don't think 6,000 rupees to the 12 Farmer. crore farmers will do it. It's okay. too, little too little in today's day and age, but it is a help. Mm. Now, whether now it depends on how they market the mm. 6,000 mm. aggressively, yeah. but that by itself will not swing it. Okay. Uh, I mean, but overall, the budget from an interim budget point of view was interesting uh, and they've done uh, and I like socks. the way corporate India has not even asked for anything this time around nobody went in with a wish list uh, uh, at all so they had resigned themselves to the thought yeah. that there is going to be no going so to be nothing, nothing, nothing for corporate raised. sector nothing has been raised, raised. yes yeah. Mr. Modi uh, will, will it uh, swing things in the government's favor I think a little bit yes whatever swing needs to be but I think one more issue which I thought I'll raise is gradually budget is losing its relevance <laughs> Because GST is there for uh, indirect taxes, uh, only direct taxes which is stabilized we from... We say this every year, yet every year, PICI, CII, ASOCHAM and everybody else lines up with, with their long list of... <laughs> because it is, it, 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 we are doing your job. <laughs> <laughs> but right. really speaking, yeah. because a major issue is government expenditure only. That's true. That's so true. we can analyze that, that's all. Yeah. No, I, 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 I do, I do in agree with you, by the way. Pranav Saita, final uh, comments from you. So I think it's a great interim budget. Actually, it brings in much more than I had expected, I'll be honest. Uh, from the final budget, however, I would feel something more structural might and, and to address infrastructure and job creation a little more directly hmm. would be far better. Okay. Uh, so the way I look at it, for example, agrarian distress, all of our hearts reach out to the farmers. But this 6,000 rupees or whatever per month, per, per year is not going to solve the problem yeah. as Sandeep yeah. also said. I think there needs to be money put into infrastructure and farm sector reform mm -hmm. such mm -hmm. that they can be much better off for a longer term period Absolutely. rather than trying to accept, expect SOPs every now and then from the budget. Absolutely. So I think that's the need of the hour, whether infrastructure in the farm sector generally or for industry to revive the capex and the investment cycle is something that I would love to see. Well, gentlemen uh, and Sangeeta, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you very much for Thank joining you. us here on the budget fine print to decode uh, the interim budget that was presented by Finance Minister Piyush Goyal. For now, from all of us here, goodbye. Many thanks for watching.